Two points, I think, that came to mind from what you just said. Number one is that everything has been offline for so long, right? And for our parents, who cares, right? Our parents are used to things being offline. So for millennials that are looking for homes, they're like, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to talk to five different people just to get one mortgage? And why am I paying this mortgage broker who's just filling out a form 125 basis points on my home? Like, what? Hey there, Lincoln here from BowAcademy.org. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Tyler Oakland, who is an investor in both Open Door and SoFi, as well as writing for Seeking Alpha, doing his own research, as I always say here, do your own research and then sharing that with the community so that we can all learn and make better decisions together. And Tyler is very active and popular on Twitter, so you should definitely check out his Twitter after watching this video. Today we're talking to Tyler Oakland about Open Door, you know, the home buyer, and of course the vertically integrated, horizontally integrated home buying and selling service that offers customers a way to sell their home in a few clicks within a day or two of listing and, or filling out an application with Open Door. And of course you can get a home mortgage, insurance, and so many other services that Tyler's gonna walk us through today. He's one of the biggest bulls on Open Door. He actually got a shout out from one of the founders on his article that he recently published on the company talking about their past, their future, and what they're doing now in order to get to that grand vision. So we're gonna hear from Tyler himself. He's gonna talk us through his vision of the company. And of course, the bear case, any headwinds that we see and how we're gonna get through all of that. We're both investors in Open Door. I've done many videos on Open Door in the past. You may have seen those. And I'm very happy to be talking to Tyler today about this because I haven't done a video on Open Door in a while besides our recent videos on their history that walks through everything that they've been through and how they got to where they are today. And now we can talk to one of their bulls about what his vision is so that it's not just me who's talking about Open Door all the time to you all. So again, I'm very happy to introduce to you Tyler Oakland. And Tyler, to start, let's just get your pitch. And of course, you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Lincoln. Um, so my name is Tyler Oakland. I, uh, I'm a surgeon and physician at Stanford Hospital um, here in the States, uh, but uh, by night I am a finance writer and, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about chatting about finance and, and researching it deeply. I write a substack called The Operator and uh, Open Door is my highest conviction pick um, and definitely the majority of my, or the largest percentage of my personal portfolio. Uh, so Open Door is a really exciting company. Um, but just to give you some background, Open Door is the category inventor and leader of iBuying, which is the business of buying and or selling a home online, including ancillary services like mortgage or title and escrow, all those little fintech opportunities. Open Door uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to forecast home prices in specific markets and then make automated offers with a little bit of human input. Um, and profits from transaction fees and those ancillary services, like I mentioned. So it's it's not a home flipper, it's a transactions company. It wants to make the home transaction process as frictionless as possible. And then it's just trying to make its money in the fee. So it's not trying to buy low or se and, and sell high. It's trying to buy at a good price, uh, sell at a reasonably similar price, and then make all of its money in that margin. Um, Open Door has been able to find incandescent product market fit since launching in 2014. Um, it has net promoter score greater than 80, nine out of 10 friends recommend. And I think a big part of that is just how good its product is, right? Like you think about the traditional way of selling a home and it's broken, right? Yeah. Uh, prior to 2021, you know, the red hot seller's market of 2021, selling was a really broken process. And so you list your home, You'd have to show it a bunch of times. It would sit on the market for 90 plus days. And there was a decent chance that even when you did get an offer, it would fall through. And so as opposed to all that complexity and, and messiness, Open Door created this process where you could just sell your home to them. They give you an offer. Uh, you know, you just take some pictures or a video of your home and send that to Open Door. They, they figure out the measurables. They give you an offer and then, you know, send someone to walk the grounds. And that money is, is, is in your front pocket, um, you know, within the week. And that's, that's a super powerful product, number one. But I think it's also been made more powerful 
because of how broken the traditional process is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually just bought a house last year and I know exactly what you mean about the headaches of it all. It from myself from my side it wasn't as bad because the seller has been trying to sell the house for a while. She had it in the market for like over a hundred days. So almost a third of a year trying to sell a single house. And if she was to use open door, of course we're in New York, open door is not here yet in Staten Island. So if she was trying to sell a house on open door, it'll be a breeze. And she would have saved right. all that time, opportunity cost of all that money that she could have had hundred days earlier, could have invested that in something else or bought another property at a cheaper price and where it was a hundred days in the future, right? So opportunity cost is a huge deal in any form of investing, especially when it comes to real estate and stock market. So having the ability to get your house sold quickly is a big deal for Open Door. Well, but with that said, of course, Open Door charges fees. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on what makes on how Open Door competes with local real estate agents and what that dichotomy is. Yeah. So I think. Um... I think, you know, for the open door team in general, they're competing. Their their competition is not Zillow, or Redfin or Offerpad. Their competition is the traditional experience. Um, and that's what they're solving for. And, you know, they they dominate the category anyways, but it, it remains that 99 plus percentage points of home transactions are done offline or done the traditional way. And so that's what open door considers to be their market opportunity and, and their ultimate incumbent competitor. Um, so, so I think, you know, they like to have, or, or they, they do have realtors involved from time to time, but a lot of this is attempting to disintermediate all the middlemen in the Byzantine real estate transaction racket, right? Like, like you think about all the individual people that are involved in buying and selling a home. Like you didn't even know these jobs existed until you go through the process yourself, right? Yeah. Like, like during my research, I, I, I found out things that just make no sense. There's seven different components to a mortgage payment, right? Like you get, you get homeowner's insurance and then you get mortgage insurance. Why do I need mortgage insurance for my, for my mortgage? How does that even make sense? You know, mm -hmm. like what's tuck pointing? What, what are all these, what are all these, di these different, these different services attached to, 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 you know, the process of a home transaction why do I need a, a title and escrow agent? Why, like, why are all these people working in different areas? And the reason that's so important is because if you have all these single product people involved in the home transaction, they're, they're charging you for their customer acquisition costs, right? So that's, you're paying, you're paying customer acquisition costs to all those different people that are involved in the transaction. And so not only is it painful and slow and, uh, opaque, but it's also more expensive than it needs to be. And so if someone was able to come in and vertically and horizontally integrate all of these services into one stack, they could bundle it and they can charge less and make more than all these single product players. And the consumer will pay less and have a better customer experience. And, and at the end of the day, that's, that's true North, right? Is if the customer can have a better experience, that's a company that I want to be invested in. And Open Door just happens to be the category leader in a completely nascent market that's never been disrupted before. And that's what gets me excited about the company. Yeah, you, you said it right. Uh, having to deal with all these agents, it, of course, people need jobs, but it makes the whole experience tougher. Having to communicate, texting, even emailing, is, it makes it so much slower of a process. It costs everyone a lot of money in the process. Of course, you have to pay them for that 6%, right? And of course, there's closing costs. And all those other fees that they that they put on top, and then having the ability to just go through open door as a buyer as well makes it removes all of those hurdles, all of those uh, extra costs. It's, it's like oh, I feel like so far and open door is so much is so similar because yeah. they're both removing these fees, they're removing, removing all these unnecessary touch points in a purchasing process that could be so much simpler. And <laughs> and it's like why have we not done this yet? So yeah, I I'm all I'm there with you. I want to talk more about the recent Q4 earnings that just came out and just, of course, everyone weren't happy with the stock based compensation, compensation, which is high. Everyone doesn't, they're not familiar with, with the, the process of paying employees in stock. So it was, it was very high. 
So I'm curious what your thoughts are on the stock based conversation. Let me get into more on the the actual results. So Open Door is an eight year old company at this point, um, and it's been uh, quietly building for gosh almost two decades uh, since 2003. Um, and in 2021, Open Door went public. And when a tech company goes public, as you know, there has to be an opportunity for early investors, early stakeholders, management, early employees um, to get liquidity. And I think that's deserved, especially in a company with a culture of frugality like Open Door, where you know employees were not making Google and Meta salaries at Open Door ever, and they never will. And so they've had to find scrappy people who they believe, um, who, who believe in, in what they're doing and the mission of empowering the American home buyer and home seller. And so as a consequence of that, these are people that probably didn't make great salaries, but need to have some sort of incentive to be there, right? You need to incentivize these missionaries to come work for the company and more than just purpose, but also financially, right? Like people, people need to make a paycheck. And so I, I, I think it's very reasonable that in the first year that the company went public, they paid out what they did in stock-based compensation. And in fact, in Q4, they got it for 75 million in stock-based compensation and ended up paying out 71. So I, I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't like a, all, all of, all of these data were available well before the earnings call, Yeah. right? Like the majority of the stock-based compensation happened in Q1, Q2, and then downtrended from there. And Q4 was actually the lowest of all the quarters this year and came in under what they, what they projected. Um, and you think about stock-based compensation at a, as a percentage of revenue too, 71 million compared to 3.82 billion in revenue, that's open door. Take mm-hmm. SoFi, a company that you and I both love, um, you know, they're guiding for 80 to 85 million in stock-based compensa- compensation next quarter and only 280 million in revenue. Right. So Open Door is doing like 15x the revenue of SoFi and mm-hmm. it's paying less stock based compensation. But there's this narrative that Open Door is paying too much in stock based compensation. It's like, you know, you can pick and choose the reasons to not invest in a company. And I, yeah. it would make more sense for a company like Palantir, for example. I mean, exorbitant. I, and, and I'm a fan of Palantir, but that's obviously too much in the form of stock based compensation. But I think for Open Door, it's, it's a totally reasonable expense. Yeah, so let's, you're right. And it's funny how investors have all this information and then it's put right in front of them. And it's like, wow, I didn't expect that. But what what would you rather a company that has employees who are investing in the company in the future? Because stock-based conversation is only valuable if it turns out to be a good company, if the company actually grows. So these employees are saying, hey, I would take your stock instead of more cash, which I do because I work at startups, and because I believe in the future of the company, I'm going to invest my time, my cash, because I'm, I'm missing out on that cash, the opportunity cost again. If I don't have that cash, then I can't invest in other opportunities. So I'm giving that up in order to invest in the future of Open Door. And so if these employees are willing to take that, as long as they're not continuously going to give out half a billion dollars every single year in this and people are buying in, I, I don't see too much of a problem here. And of, of course, you said they're they're making crazy revenues. I believe in 2019 they sold 19,000 homes and made four billion, four point some billion. And then this year they sold 21,000 and made eight billion. Can you speak? Can you speak to that about how much more efficient that is? Yeah, I, that's a that's a great point. I was I was looking at this too because the difference in the number of homes they sold was like 2,000 homes, but the revenue was like. 80% higher, mm-hmm. um, which is which is really, really impressive. I, I mean, I think that there, there are a few tailwinds for that. For example, like uh, home price appreciation has been dramatic since 2019. Mm-hmm. And so that's a part of it. Their average home that they're that they're buying and selling at this point is in the $400,000 range. Um, back in 2019, it was uh, in the like 250 to 300 range. And so that's that's obviously a piece of it. Um, the other thing too is as their buy box has expanded, they've they've built up a presence in places like California where their average home price sale is in the seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollar range. Mm-hmm. And so their gross profit per home, but also their their overall revenue um, kind of scales higher as a consequence of that. But then the really exciting component 
is the ancillary services and the buy with open door ecosystem that are adding to that that gross revenue. So ancillary services like title and escrow growing rapidly, um, triple digits this past year. Uh, mortgage still early days, but I think in the second half of this year, you're going to see that become a meaningful contributor um, to margins, and we're going to see an uplift uh, as a consequence of of attaching there. Um, but but the real revenue increase is probably from the the buy with open door ecosystem. So open door backed offers, um, and then just buy buy an open door home. Those are beginning to contribute materially to open doors revenue, and I think they're probably at like a two two plus billion uh, revenue run rate in that ecosystem alone today. So can you tell me about really? why that it's so much of an advantage over the comp competition because I've, I've spoken to it in the past and I've tried to bring this home to people about vertical integration and right and every company that I work for I try to find vertical integration how because it is incredibly impor important as a advantage over other competitors so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that like uh like vertically integrating yeah all these services right the whole process be able to control the, the the customer throughout their whole lifespan, not having to send them somewhere else, right? Yeah. And not having to pay someone else for that service. So I think to understand this concept best, you have to start with the proposition that the consumer experience is number one. Mm -hmm. If If you can make your goal as a company, the consumer experience, then you will always come back to this concept of vertical integration and owning the transaction end to end. And the reason this is critical is exactly for the reason you said, because if you don't own the entire transaction, if you if you can get someone into your ecosystem, but then you have to guide them out to a mortgage broker or a real estate agent or, you know, a loan officer, you can't you can't make sure that they come back. Right. You you can't control their experience with that person because you don't they don't work for you. They're just they're just paying you for a lead. And so the consumer experience is never going to be as good as it possibly can if you own the entire experience and everyone that they interact with reports to you. And that's that's really critical, right? Because if you can own the experience, then then you can relentlessly pursue the opportunity for the consumer to be as happy as possible. Like Zillow recently talked about how they, you know, they recently reported Q4 earnings and it was well received by the market. They they gave some audacious goals for 2025. They, um, you know, they changed their soundbite from we're you know we're building Zillow 2.0 to we're we're building Zillow 3.0 and we're building the housing super app. And I've I've researched the concept of super app quite mm -hmm. deeply. Um, in fact, in January I wrote an article about SoFi in which I really delved into the concept of of building a super app. And and as we've been talking about, you can't build a super app. If you don't control the transaction, if you have to guide people through and they go, they go other places, they might not come back and they might not have a good experience. And that's not how you build a super app. A super app is a walled garden that a consumer's a consumer never leaves. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reason this is so important for for open doors, not just the consumer experience, but also the basic finances of, of super app. And that goes back to what we previously discussed, which is open door doesn't have to pay customer acquisition cost for any of these products. And so it can charge less and make more than all competitors. And so not only is it better from a financial perspective, but it's better from a consumer perspective. And that's a winning, that's a winning strategy in my opinion. Yeah. And with vertical integration, as you say, all the benefits of it have not having to pay someone else, having able to control the whole customer experience, which leads to open door having higher net, net promoter scores and customer satisfaction and then having them continue to come back and then telling their friends about it, bringing more customers, all fire continues. And for the customer, that's great, right? But then for the investor, when you're investing in a company op with a uh, vertical integration also goes optionality, right? Those two are very important for investors. If you can decrease costs of vertical integration and increase efficiencies of that, but then also have the, have the, 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 the ability to have the optionality to go make money in various areas, like you said, title and escrow, home mortgages, uh, and other home services that I have on the screen right now, you decrease your risk. So you and I feel very comfortable investing incredibly heavily and aggressively into very few companies because we have companies that we're investing in that are invested 
in various uh, segments, right? Because they're diversifying for us. We don't have to diversify. So we are, we're insulated from some of the risk due to the fact that they are they have so much option optionality. So yeah, I'm just curious on what your thoughts are on the optionality of Open Door versus its competitors like Zello, who now are saying, oh, well, we can't do eye buying because it doesn't work. Well, maybe you're just not doing it right. So I'm curious on why they're not doing it right and how that fits with the optionality. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, so, so, I mean, I think you probably know this, but just as like a little backstory for anyone who doesn't know when Zillow got into iBuying, they came in to iBuying in 2018. And so their current CEO, Rich Barton, who founded Zillow, actually wasn't with the company as CEO at the time. And he was brought in in 2018 to build Zillow 2.0, which is which was going to be an iBuyer. Um, it was going to compete with Open Door. And I believe the prevailing sentiment for, for why he went that route was, was one of fear. He felt like the iBuyers were going to displace uh, Zillow's marketplace, Zillow and Redfin's marketplace. And so he came in, they spent billions of dollars, hired thousands of people, spent three years uh, competing in the space. And in Q3, their business imploded in spectacular fashion. And there were a lot of different excuses for why this happened. Um, one, that the market was too small. Two, that you know consumers weren't happy when they turned down when they turned them down. Um, three, that home prices were too volatile and they couldn't they couldn't do it properly. But behind the scenes, you know, Zillow insiders have been very clear that those aren't really the reasons that that they failed. Um, they actually attribute it to an internal mission called Project Catch Up. Um, catch up, uh, which was Zillow's attempt to scale as rapidly as Open Door. And if you look at the 2021 first half of the year, quarters one and two, like the writing was on the wall then. Zillow was struggling in Q1 and Q2 to figure out how best to acquire homes so that you know their algorithms or, or their management, whatever it was, they weren't able to acquire homes at the pace they wanted. And so they weren't able to build up inventory. And I think in Q3, we saw a moment of frustration and they began to try to pick up as many homes as possible. And I, it's my belief, and this is sheer speculation, but this is my, it's my belief that Open Door found out that Zillow was trying to scale and um, you know, become larger than them in acquisition volume and home resale volume. And I think that they, they were sort of like, like two people in a race and they were like, keep up. And they kept buying more houses and Zillow kept buying more houses. But Open Door was playing an intelligent game of chess. And when home prices started going down in Q3, they continued to pay less and less dollars for those homes. Meanwhile, Zillow kept paying more and more and more. Um, and so in Q3 and Q4, Open Door had not their best quarters in terms of margin and Zillow failed. And they haven't said this explicitly, but it's my belief that their low margins in Q3 and Q4 were at least in part impacted by the massive inventory that they bought to lure Zillow into an unwinnable game mm -hmm. and squash them. Yeah. And that goes back to, I was, I was just looking through your, your Twitter before the call and I saw some guy post about how uh, Open Door bought a house for what, 882,000, I believe it was. And then they had to sell it for 870,000, I believe it was Q3. And he was making a point that oh, it was, uh, Open Door got because they're holding on for so long, they got they got hurt because they couldn't make the, the the sale at a higher price. But then you went into how they actually make their money, right? And this comes back to optionality, right? Like, like I said, having optionality is part of the reason they could beat someone like Zillow who try to enter their field because Zillow doesn't have those other options that Open Door has to insulate itself from losses on the top line. So yeah, I'm curious how on, on that math and what you what you said to the guy. People, people on Twitter seem to like to um, find individual data points on a home that Open Door bought and sold, and say, you know, look at this. They bought a home for three hundred thousand, sold it for two hundred fifty thousand. Open Door is clearly unprofitable, and they're going to die like Zillow did. Um, first off, from a statistical perspective, that's just that's just bad math. Um, that's not that's not how math should be should be done. Um, especially for a company that's going to be doing 12,000 plus home sales this quarter, like one data point 
is, is not useful. Um, mm. it, I mean, it, it's worse than anecdotal. And the other thing, you know, that's important to say is that open doors pricing algorithm is a bell curve, right? So there will always be variance. And as an American consumer, I don't want open door to make money on the home sale in all of their home sales, right? I'm not just like a, a greedy investor. Like part of my reason for investing in, in open door is because I think we need it as, as American consumers. I think the process of buying and selling homes should be a wonderful experience. It's the biggest asset class of our life. So it should be, it should be like a wonderful, I'm so happy. I have all this transparency and liquidity and I, I'm educated about my decisions and I feel like I made the right one. But it's not like that. It's broken right now. And so that's that's one of the main reasons I'm invested in, in Open Door. But going back to what I'm saying, like if Open Door was just making 10% on every home that it sold, I would I would question if that was actually a good consumer product. And so this goes back to the concept that Open Door is not trying to buy low and sell high. They're trying to buy relatively close to the price that they're going to sell at, and then they make their money in the fee. So that guy that said Open Door bought for eight hundred eighty thousand and sold for eight hundred seventy thousand, on paper it was a twelve thousand dollar loss, but Open Door got a five percent fee, which is forty two thousand on eight hundred eighty thousand. So forty two thousand minus thirty two thousand, it was a thirty thousand gross profit transaction, and that's not including ancillary services, mm -hmm. which today you know we're getting Open Door's margins throughout twenty twenty one. I think it was like nine point one percent. That's without the benefit of all of these ancillary attached services like mortgage, um, you know, further attachment of title and escrow, um, home loans, you know, all, all these all these other different fintech verticals that they can attach that will see a meaningful uplift in margins in the future. Yeah, I, I really like that response. So let's let's talk about a little bit about the full year Q uh, twenty twenty one, and of, then we can get into some of the twenty twenty two outlook. I'm just curious what your what your take was on 2021 overall, especially as we're trying to escape this pandemic. So we can do like 30,000 foot view and get as granular as you want. But from a from a 30,000 foot view, Open Door scaled from essentially zero inventory in Q4 of 2020, um, sort of in the midst of, of COVID. That's when everyone was getting vaccinated and everything. So scaled from essentially zero inventory to uh, 6 billion in inventory over the latter half of, of 2022. They sold over 21,000 homes. They more than doubled guidance for revenue. So they guided for 3.5 billion. They did eight. Um, they guided for negative EBITDA margins and they had positive EBITDA margins. Mm -hmm. um, they more than doubled buy box. They launched two products for the buyer ecosystem, which was critical because it was a seller's market. They acquired four companies and they knocked off their biggest competitor. So I think for a company that is scaling from you know, the darkness of COVID to becoming the category dominating player in iBuying for the biggest undisrupted asset class in the world, 2021 was a spectacular year. Yeah, and I'm curious, people wanna have it both ways that they will say, oh, they did poorly because of the pandemic, that it was going to be a bad time for them. They're just still not profitable. And then they want to say, oh, well, they did. They they sold so many homes because of the pandemic and it was a seller market. So I'm just curious, going into the time where we're trying, we're going to escape this pandemic and get back to normalcy, where home prices might depreciate a little bit or not rise as fast. I'm curious, on based on history, what your thoughts are on where we might see the real estate market overall, and then we can get into what your vision is or what we what the company has guided for 2022 and how that fits into the picture of real estate appreciation or depreciation from this time that we're in right now. So when you think about Open Door's value proposition, when it was first launched in, in 2014, its flagship product is sell to Open Door, um, which as we talked about, is a tool to make selling your home easier. And the reason they started with that product is because historically selling your home has been the most miserable part of the transaction. And there's two parts of every transaction. There's selling and buying. Selling is finance, buying is romance, right? But even, even comparatively speaking, selling your home has always been considered a worse experience than buying a home, even though the buying system is broken as well. But the reason this is important to double tap is because if open door service was to help sellers, then the service has less value inherently in a seller's market. 
right? So if you think about it, a seller's market is a headwind for open door because, you know, if you tried to sell your home in 2021, you've got a home, you put it on the market, you will close that weekend. You know what I mean? If not earlier, and you'll have five offers, all of them over asking price. Um, they'll name their babies after you if you just say yes. You know what I mean? Like, like white hot seller's market. That's that's a product that Open Door is the opposite. Uh, op it was built for the exact opposite market conditions yeah. of a seller's market, right? They are built for a down market or a buyer's market because in a down market or a buyer's market, you don't have any tools to sell your home. So you can you can put it up, sure, put it on Zillow, put it on Redfin, talk to your realtor. But if no one wants to buy houses or if they want to buy it for less and they're not competing with anyone, then you know, you're, you're sort of, you don't have any options. And that's why if open door was around during a down market or a buyer's market, it'd be like, yes, please. Conversion would be higher. You could ratchet up fees if you want to. And consumers would still be like, thank you. Like now I have equity in my pocket because I have to move um, and I can start my life. And so that's really important to consider is that open door 14 X revenue in Q4 on, on the back of a white hot seller's market. Um, so it was able to navigate these incredible headwinds. One, I think it speaks to the, the core culture and competency of, of the management team and, and the employees, but also to how strong their product market fit is. And so that even in a seller's market, they were able to just destroy their original expectations and manage record, record conversion. Um, I, I don't even know how that's possible. Like, it doesn't make sense. But you hear people say things like, like uh, open door managed to lose money in, you know, this super rapid home price appreciation environment. It's like, you, you don't really understand the dynamics of the company. The value proposition is much cleaner in a, in a down or seller's market. Yeah. Before we get to just 2022 outlooks, uh, what you just said at last point was that people are looking at the short term, right? There, you can find anything bad about a company in the short term. And the issue of that as an investor, you're supposed to be looking at the long term. You're not, you're not buying or investing for today, you're investing for where the company is going, which is why, again, we go back to the stock-based conversation. These employees are investing in the future. So as an investor, you should be doing the same thing. If I'm investing for the long term, but my companies that I'm investing in are trying to do very quick uh, games and try to make quick wins like you saw with Zillow, and then they burn out, I, I get burnt. Right. So I want to have some alignment there with my companies. And as an investor, you need to look for the long term. Sure, you might see, oh, Open Door is not profitable today and oh, it's not it's not great. But that means you get to buy in at a lower price so that in the future, when they do become profitable, then you have the chance to benefit from that upside. So there's there's so much upside here. And we see again that they've beaten their expectations. You said it. They beat expectations over and over again. And so they're guiding for even more great news in 2022 or great growth in 2022. And yeah, that means that you now with, with the stock just completely crushed due to macro uh, reasons as well, you have the opportunity to buy in. So I'm, I'm curious, Tyler, what what's the guidance for 2022 and why should investors be excited despite the currently crushed, depressed stock, stock price and the wars and inflation and interest rates, and all the other macro reasons, right? Can you tell me more about the, the future of Open Door this year and going forward? A few, a few things I think are important to preface this with. One is that I think Open Door, in terms of guidance, is a very conservative company. And that, and that goes back to the company in general, right? Like their core competency is risk management. And so just to run that ship, run a ship as operationally complex as Open Door, management has to be conservative, almost paranoid, just to make things, keep the lights on every day and the ice cream from melting. Um, so that's, that's, that's number one. The second thing I'd say is that in 2021, they guided for 3.5 billion. In 2022, you know, when they did their original investor presentation, 3.5 billion in 2021, and six and some change in 2022, they actually did 8 billion in 2021. And currently they're guiding for 8 billion in the first half of 2022. So a hundred, you know, they're they're making up the entirety of their of their revenue in the first half of this year is what they're guiding for. Um, which I think is 
is pretty solid, right? Because I hardly think the first half of this year is going to be the um, the strongest quarter. So I think, a- as they've always shown, um, they will continue to increase revenue on a quarterly basis, particularly in the back half. So I'm modeling for 20 billion, um, uh, maybe a little bit higher in, in 2022, which I think off of a base of 8 billion is is pretty fast. It makes it the fastest growing fintech company I've ever seen, certainly from that base of revenue. One of the one of the other things I'd mention is that I track Open Doors transaction history. So because I've been loud on Twitter and um, because I've been able to make some internet friends, I have some very intelligent friends who uh, who are you know software engineers and developers at different tech companies who have built very elegant home transaction scraping data that I, I'm able to use to make my estimates and uh, monitor the success of the company. And I'm going to I'm going to release some figures and my projections for for Q1. I mean, we're not at the we're not at the end of the quarter, but we're pretty close uh, at this point. And so I, I I should be very close with with my estimates. I'd like to think, but you know, they guided for eight billion between Q1 and Q2. I think they're going to do just to give you a sneak peek. I think that they're going to do probably five billion in this first quarter in revenue alone. Um, hopefully they can build up inventory and make that 8 billion figure look more like 10 billion between the first two quarters. Uh, but, but either way, I mean, they've been conservative and so far my checks seem to indicate that it indeed was very conservative. Yeah. Thank you for walking through that. And I'm looking forward to seeing your, what you have on that, uh, those projections. I was reading your article and of course the CEO of one of the founders gave you a shout out for that and said that everything you know about Open Door is in this article. So anyone watching, if you're interested in Open Door, I would definitely suggest going and checking out that article because you do make some great points. And of course you talk through the headwinds as well. But one of the things I really liked that you said in there was that if you're, I'm not really big on baseball, but your analogy was great, that if you're swinging for defenses, you're going to, you're going to strike out a lot. You're going to, you're going to miss a lot. Right. But every once in a while, you're going to hit that home run. And so that's how these growth companies work, especially open door. We, we're going to, we're going to swing a lot and we're going to have some miss. Like you said, it's a bell curve. And, but over the long term, we're going to, we're going to have great, great, uh, home runs. And I know you put in there, your, your home services, uh, vision for open door. I, I would love for you to talk more about that and how we get there, of course. So in the article, I, t- I talked about this idea of open door home, uh, which is the chance for open door to become something more than a one off infrequent uh, large asset transaction company. Um, and the reason that's so important is, you know, the, the average American home buyer, home seller moves roughly every seven to eight years. OK, and so even if you build this incredible product that consumers love, even if you delight them and they tell all their friends, they can only be customers for you once every seven, eight years, which is not horrible if you're playing a long game, right? Like if we're measuring this in, in decades, it's not that bad because you get you know zero customer acquisition costs for that customer for life. They'll always come back to you and they'll always recommend their friends. And that's that's fine. But from an investing and business perspective, it's it's not a great business, right? It's low margin anyways. So if we're having this low margin transaction that only happens for an individual consumer every seven to eight years, bad business. So Open Door Home is the opportunity for for Open Door to turn that infrequent transaction into a multi-decade relationship with that consumer um, combined with recurring sticky subscription revenue. And so what, what I talked about was how do we get there, right? Like, how do we how do we get the consumer to keep Open Door top of mind for decades? And and I think that goes back to Open Door continuing to to horizontally build out its services and then vertically integrate them. And and so what we talked about was Open Door Home should be the concept of your home being an intelligent piece of technology that you run and you have transparency in and you have access to all these tools that have historically been you know, offline or, or um, uh, unrelated services. And so um, I talked about things like security and access, right? Deliveries, 
garage door open and close, lights, all the basic home tech um, items, but also a dashboard that you could have in your home where things like, you know, you know, finances, what your, what your mortgage is, click to refinance, um, what your home is worth on an hour to hour basis backed by an open door backed offer. Um, so you've got your finances there. But then also things like one click to send a handyman to help with your garage, just your garbage disposal. Um, you know, one click to get a cleaning service and pick your day that they come. Um, and, you know, another click to make it a subscription process or pool maintenance or, you know, gutter cleaning, wh whatever it is. And because Open Door has owned your home uh, and they know all the data about it, as time goes on, if things are breaking in your home or they feel like it's time for something to be renewed, they can send you push notifications and say, hey, it might be time to, to look at changing your roof. Here's a service that we offer and here's our here's our estimate, right? No advertising costs because the consumer is already in the ecosystem. Um, and because they know so much about that home, they can underwrite risk. So home warranty, home insurance, they have better data than everyone else so that they can underwrite all those products at much lower, lower uh, cost. Um, and then there's there's additional things like home renovation, right? Which they've they've acquired two digital home renovation companies in Skylight and Pro.com. Um, and this can be considered in the transaction service. So you buy a house with open door, there's an option, hey, do you want us to outfit the kitchen with Viking appliances? Or, um, you know, do you, do you want us to put a marble countertop in your kitchen? And they tell you what the price is and you say, yes, have this done for me before my move in. And that'll be an incredible e-commerce like checkout. But I think that can also be incorporated into the open door home concept as well. Like I'm considering renovating my kitchen, one click to tap, talk to a contractor or designer and we'll walk you through what that'll look like. We've got a 3D image of your home because we owned it and took pictures. So we can manually change things in real time. And not only that, but use our world-class automated valuation model to tell you how this investment in this project will influence the value of your home. Uh, so you're marrying things like fiscal responsibility with creativity. Yeah, man, um, that gives me chills because I I'm all about when you said um, what's it called no customer acquisition. I'm like speaks to my my soul because if you can have the customer, that's the beauty of this your whole your whole uh, idea here. This uh, open door home. If you have the customer from start to finish from buying that home or even selling it and get, get even and getting another house through open door if you have them in the door you give them home home mortgage you give them the home insurance and they choose you over open over over something like lemonade because it's just more convenient to go through a one-stop shop and then you give them the ability to renovate and to uh shop uh contractors right and all of the services in one place it just makes so much, much, so much sense. Even if it costs a little bit more, or even considerably more. We just bought our, this house in 2021, and we decided to renovate our our kitchen. And we we looked at different contractors, of course, and we eventually just went. It was very quick. We didn't. I, I'm all about convenience. Uh, I make enough money now. I can I can choose convenience over uh, trying to penny pin, uh, pinch. So we went with uh, Home Depot. Because they came in and they said, here's all the options. Here's the countertops. Here's the cabinets. All of that and different very different uh, options. And we can get it done for you in a week. And if it breaks, if anything goes wrong, we don't care. Just call us and we'll come back. And we'll get it done for you. Right? No no cost. For 5, 7, 20, whatever years. It's, it's just convenient. I don't have to worry. I, it's carefree. And that's a big thing for me. I, will, I'm, I much prefer... Paying a little bit more to not have to care, to not have to con uh, be worried, because that's all. That's what that's what kills you, stress. So if I can just say, "Hey, open door," I'm gonna give you my whole home, right? You handle all of this for me. I, I just want to live here and be happy. That makes me so much more of a of a happy customer than if I have to go to contractor one and two and and negotiate different prices. Right. And then if things go wrong, they have we have to haggle and say, hey, can you come back? Oh, this is going to cost me a hundred dollars more. And you can only come back in uh, two weeks or whatever. That that isn't worth the money to me. And I think most people who are in the demographic that Open Door is eventually looking for with poor people who are higher earners or even just uh, middle class, they're going to be the same. They're going to want to just have it done. 
And so that's yeah. why I really like this idea. And of course, you get into the SaaS model, which is beautiful, right? Because again, you build once and you get paid over and over again. It's vertically integrated and the customer is happy and it's, it was horizontally uh, built out and, and integrated. So you have the optionality to to make some money here, lose some money there so that the customer can be happier. And so they continue to stay with you because you can make you can take all your profits from, from one division and continue to build out multiple services on top of your entire offering. Just like Amazon did right, with AWS. You lose lots of money on Amazon Prime, but then you make lots and lots of profits on uh, AWS so that you can continue to offer that to customers and continue to build that moat. Right, and I think that's that's really where Open Door is headed, and it's great that the 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 founders said, "Hey, I saw this, and I'm thinking about it too." So that means that it's in their heads, right? So it's not just an idea that you have; is that people are thinking about this at the company. Yeah, I, two two points I think that came to mind um, from what you just said. Number one is that everything has been offline for so long, right? And for our parents, who cares, right? Our parents are used to things being offline. Our parents are like. Like, you know, like this is just the way it is. And, and it and it's it's fine for them because they've seen the world in a few different iterations of technology. And so it's less jarring when they're interacting with something that's offline. But for our generation and for the generations that come after us, we're going to be increasingly seeking a digital solution. And and so when faced with the offline and terrible experience of real estate, I think it's it's going to be like, like the value proposition is becoming wider, right? Like, like it, it's, it's becoming more polarizing. I think with each year that, that home, that home transactions aren't brought into the, the digital age. And so for millennials that are looking for homes, they're like, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to talk to five different people just to get one mortgage? And why am I paying this mortgage broker? Who's just filling out a form 125 basis points on my home? Like what? why why do I have to do all these things? Why can't it just be in one place? And so I think increasingly we're going to see that this this opportunity to revolutionize real estate and why why it's so important for for the American consumer. In terms of economics, the thing I wanted to bring up is is if you can think about sell with open door and buy with open door and the fintech attachment there as a wedge into the into the real estate transaction stack, this open door home concept, is a subscription service that could add something like 20 to 30 basis points per home per year. Um, and, you know, when Open Door reaches a scale that it's shooting for, which is, you know, 100,000 homes um, in inventory, for example, if they can attach the Open Door home concept to 10 to 25% of, of those homes, that is a lot of revenue. Um, and it's high margin revenue that they've been able that they've been able to to integrate and and collect. Um, so you can have you know your eight percent gross profit margins or whatever it is, but if you're making a quarter a quarter of a percent every year on that home for seven to eight years, that's a powerful business model. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only that, but because you've kept that consumer top of mind, and because they have, or because you've kept open door top of mind, and because you have that sticky model with this super smart home. That makes other homes seem dumb, right? Homes that don't have the technology that open door homes do. You're not going to move to a regular old fashioned home after that. Like you are in the ecosystem. And Mm -hmm. once, once we're confronted as consumers, once we're confronted with a digital experience that is more convenient, um, simpler and easier to use, we don't go back, right? Like we don't use carrier pigeons anymore. We, we, you know what I mean? Like we, we don't watch movies in 480p. Like, we demand a certain level of of consistency or improvement and we don't go back and so if open door can do that for our homes those are going to be lifelong open door customers yeah and just that point you made about customer uh, consumers liking to just stay to what they've they've uh, learned and with uh, better services that reminds me of uh, robin hood and it just changed the game because now if I want to know what my wealth is, I'm invested all through Robinhood and uh, SoFi, all online in real time. I can just check and see, hey, how wealthy am I today? Now, <laughs> how wealthy am I based uh, compared to last year, right? But with real estate, it's very hard to know 
what the value of your home is. And one thing you said recently, I think it was either in your article or on Twitter, is that with uh, Open Door, in the future, you'll be able to just open your Open Door app and see how, how much your house is worth. And I don't think most places offer that. And even Zillow tries to offer that with Zillow estimates, as estimates, but now they've lost all credibility because they couldn't even use that for their own business. Right. But Open Door is making it work. And so they can people can say, oh, well, Open Door uses this number to buy and sell houses so I can trust it. And so you can look at your Open Door um, uh, app as you live in your house that you bought through Open Door and see what it's worth. And then if you ever want to sell that, you can sell back to Open Door, move to another house through through Open Door and then continue to see, oh, my, my house is becoming more and more valuable. And I know how much I'm how much uh, wealth I have. And I can go take out. A, another maybe a business loan or whatever based on this valuation right and i can trust it because the appraiser is going to come in at a similar price right right or you can or you can get a loan against you know open door can offer you like a personal loan for a home renovation pro- project against your home's equity um i mean there's all sorts of fintech fintech verticals there but totally agree yeah, yeah that's correct but the other thing is because they have a lower cost of capital they can pass on those savings to the customer. And this goes back to my original thesis for Open Door 2, which is if if we assume that everyone is a commodity player, um, which I'm not saying that everyone is, but just like from a base, if we if we underestimate everyone and just level the playing field and say everyone is a commodity player, the lowest cost structure provider will win. That is like a basic tenet of business. If you're the lowest cost structure provider, if you can make the most from the lowest fees, you're going to you're going to win the category. We could talk about this all day. I don't want to take up more of your time. We've been here for a while now, so I'm going to let you go. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about Open Door and SoFi. Probably going to release these in two different videos because um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been way too long. But any last any last thoughts that you have on Open Door and then SoFi? I, I guess, you know, the thing I'd say um, when, when I wrote my SoFi article in January, I said, um, the discounts of December won't last forever. And, uh, you know, again, I was early, it's continued, continued to happen. But every day that these companies are growing rapidly, and every day that their stock prices remain depressed, is an opportunity to capture value that is inappropriately measured, or in, in incompletely captured, right. And so, these are these are opportunities that if if you have conviction and you you've built up that muscle and you believe in the company, these are opportunities to create generational wealth, um, and that's that's really exciting. Um, and you know, Tesla, for example, is a great company, but Tesla has reached this point where it's not misunderstood anymore. It's 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 valued appropriately and then some. And, and so I, I would love to be invested in a company like Tesla, but there's no arbitrage anymore between under the understanding of the company's value and, and you know, what, it, what it's actually worth. Companies like Open Door and SoFi are in the stage where they're, it's a show me stage where they still have to prove themselves. They still have to convince the world of their value. And, and as a result, it's an opportunity to, to get in at like a private equity stage valuation. And that's really exciting for someone like me is I'd like to be invested in a Tesla, but I I don't I I'd rather be invested as I was before it blew up. Mm-hmm. So I can I can gain value as the rest of the world finally catches on to to what the company is really worth. And I think that that's something that we're going to see in these two companies, Open Door and SoFi, my two highest conviction picks, because there's so much value that's not on the table right now that that people aren't accessing. Um, and it might be a long road, but it's it's one that because I've built this conviction, it's a road that I'm I'm willing to walk. Yeah, and you that is completely right, uh, Tyler. And just to drive that point home, I bought uh, Tesla on May 24th, right here. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Everyone was saying, oh, it's, it's it's going bankrupt, right? Everyone was, I kept reading that summer. I actually left my job right before that. That is going bankrupt. I sold a company and took half the profits from that company and put it all into, into Tesla. And then the next year, it just blew up. 
right? So you might not see, like you said, you might not see SoFi and Open Door get there that quickly because we're still at an early stage. But Tesla started all the way out here, and even before that, ten years now, twenty of uh, eleven years now that they've been on the market, and people who bought at those lower prices. Even through all of the headaches and trying to go through manufacturing, they had a harder time than we're gonna have with SoFi and, and Open Door because they're all about hardware. Hardware is super hard, but we're in a in a software business, right? It's, it's increasingly cheaper revenue, and we we've seen the problems before. We we're not we're not trying to build a whole new type of car. This we're not building rockets here, right? We're just building better systems, right? So, fully agree with everything you said. And I want to just uh, give you the opportunity to just quickly share any any uh, resources that you have for investors who are looking into uh, Open Door and SoFi. Uh, yeah, so um, so I, I write a Substack called The Operator. Um, I, I try to write an article once every six weeks or so. Um, it's hard because I, I have a full time job and the, the articles take a long a long time. Um, they also are published on Seeking Alpha if you're there. Um, and, uh, I'm loud on Twitter as well. If, uh, if you want updates on, on, uh, you know, open door, Palantir, SoFi, Unity, um, or crypto, that's kind of where you can find me, Tyler Oakland. I should be the only one, um, in regards to resources that I use, it's really just like, I watch every, every podcast, I read every, every piece of information that's written about the company. And I, I try to build that into, a strategic narrative. Like I try to imagine if I was in, if I was in the boardroom or if I was in the C-suite having those conversations, like, why would I, why would they do what they did? Um, and then build out the strategy from there. Um, I really like getting into the heads of the founders or the leaders of the company. And so I watch all their podcasts. I read the books that they, that they, you know, say were important for them. And I think psychologically that helps me align with the way that they think about building their business, you know, my own my own sort of uh, deep research. Yeah, the best tool is Google, right? <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to do the research, and yeah, I, I appreciate you again coming here, giving us all this, all these gems on both Open Door and SoFi. I think everyone's gonna love this. Okay, that's it. I want to say thank you again to Tyler for joining us to discuss both Open Door and SoFi this week, as the markets go into turmoil for growth stocks at least and of course for every all of the stock market is really struggling right now due to the macros such as the war between russia and ukraine and the federal reserve raising interest rates soon and inflation continue to grow there's lots of reasons for the markets to be down but i hope that this video really showed you why these companies are worth investing in for the long term and what you can look forward to and of course some of the the headwinds that we have to get through in order to get to that future that we all want so if you enjoyed this i want to see more like it i need you to do your part all it is is to hit a couple buttons just what three like subscribe hit the notification bell and then comment comment your thoughts on so far on open door are you invested in any of them do you believe in their future? Are you trying to trade or how many shares do you have? Let us know. I would love to hear from all of you and I always do my best to get back to every comment. So let's discuss. And if you just want to say hi, I would love to hear from you. Hi. And of course, as always, these videos are brought to you by our patrons at patreon.bowacademy.org who support this channel financially and help me brainstorm new video ideas to share with all of you by discussing the stock market in real time every day in our Discord channel where we share knowledge, news, rumors, and new investment ideas so we can all do our own research and then come back together and collaborate. And it will be great to have you join us. So if you're interested in any of that, I would love to see you over at patreon.bowacademy.org. I'm Lincoln with bowacademy.org. Thank you again and have a great day.